Okay, I want to talk about how China saved me. A totally different theme than you've seen in any other video about China, I'm sure. Because you typically hear just the opposite in the West, in the Western media. But this is a true story. And it's taken me years to, sun, to start to make sense of it. And so I'm talking about China after the fact. I'm in China now, but I mean after the fact, 11 years after I first arrived here in Nanjing, south of where I am now, which is Yantai, China. If you look at a map and look for the East China Sea, uh, look for a giant peninsula that juts out into that sea. That is Shandong province, and I'm at the tip of that peninsula, sort of roughly up near Beijing, kind of southeast of Beijing, uh, some distance. And so that's where I am now, and I used to be in the capital of this province before that, Jinan, which is west of me, and Nanjing is southwest of me. Basically still in eastern China, where most of the population lives. And so when I arrived in Nanjing, um, I was a professor. I taught at one of the universities, and Nanjing has something like, uh, I believe it's like 45 or 50 universities, believe it or not. It's got to be one of the university cities of the world. And I, I was just reading, it's apparently ranked second in the world uh, in terms of research about environmental science and natural resources, I believe. And s so second in that, and I think third in chemistry. Uh, so there's a lot of publications coming out of there because there's so many universities. Well, I was teaching at one of these universities and I arrived here 11 years ago, January 2013. And just immediately after arriving in China, I'd, I'd done an earlier trip uh, before that, basically to go visit the campus of the university to get a sense of what uh, the situation was going to be like, because it's quite different from the West. And I knew that. I'd been told that about friends at University of Toronto, which is where I got my PhD. And um, so, I had done that earlier, about 12 years ago, and so it was about 11 and a half years ago that I started in China in January of 2013. And so actually moving there this time, my assistant met me in Shanghai at the airport, and we took the subway across uh, Shanghai, and then we caught the high-speed train up to Nanjing. And the first impressions I got, you know, of course, I, I'd already met him before. Uh, his name is Jang. And, uh, but other people, strangers, people that I didn't know, they would greet me with, welcome to China. And this was the first thing that kind of hit me funny. I just thought, oh, that's kind of an odd thing to say. And, uh, and it happened often enough from strangers, they would just say, welcome to China. And it felt like I was entering the gates of a small village. That, that's seriously what I felt. A small village called China of 1.4 billion. So you get a totally different view. And I know most of us in the West are intimidated by the numbers in China, just kind of overwhelmed by it. But it's more like, I say, uh, the feel of it is more like a village, <laughs> believe it or not, in many ways, how people interact with each other, especially in traditional China. And I guess that's a key part of my story is that I've been basically living in more traditional China. So Nanjing is one of China's four ancient great capitals because it was the capital of China for 10 different dynasties. So a long history of being a capital. And so there's actually quite a quite a uh, manufacturing trade in silk, some of the finest silk that the emperors would wear in Nanjing. Um, and so um, so it, it has this long history, so maybe that's why people were kind of different, but I also got kind of greeted in 
Shanghai, I think some, some people would also say welcome to China to me. And so that was the number one thing. And the number two thing I would remember is just people really helping me out, say on the subway or any kind of daily um, activity that I was trying to do. Basically, I felt like everyone is watching me, not spying on me, but just looking out for me. That's what it felt like. And so with the subway, if I looked slightly lost, in no time at all, someone would come up to me and it would just be really surprising because often it would be like a young girl, uh, you know, maybe in her 20s or something, and I'm an older man, and so I just couldn't imagine this in Canada, a girl of that age coming up to hold, help an older male stranger. And uh, so, and I mean help, I don't mean just point and, you know, show on the map, oh, you go right, left, and whatnot. I mean, they would ride the subway with you for like five, ten stations. They would take like a half hour, an hour out of their day to help you. It was unbelievable. Like just like a warm blanket coming to China. The treatment. And it wasn't just the young girls. So I, you know, I'm well aware I'm a white male and, you know, high status and all that. I definitely felt that in China. But I also had men. Uh, come up and help me with things too. And one instance I remember is in the cafeteria, a cafeteria, one of the many, at the university. Uh, I was struggling to eat some kind of food, I don't remember exactly what, and I was using chopsticks, and someone was obviously helping or watching me. And uh, so this man, he just walks up and hands me a spoon. He doesn't know any English or anything. We couldn't really communicate. I just had to say thank you. And, uh, but what a kind gesture. You know, you're in this completely alien culture. You know, I don't know the language. I still don't, embarrassing as that is. And I can't read the characters. It's impossible. The food is really different. It's, it's completely different from the Chinese food I would even eat in Canada because I haven't lived in that part of China where that food tradition comes from that we have in basically, I think, the most of the world, North America for sure. I've lived in all these other places that have a different food tradition. So I've had to get rid of or get used to uh, un very unusual foods too. And so just alien in so many ways, and yet so kind, looking out for you. You feel like you're not invisible at all. And so everyone's looking out for me. Uh, it was another uh, getting my hair cut. Uh, the hairdresser, a male hairdresser, young male hairdresser, told me he was honored to cut my hair. He had never cut the hair of a foreigner before, so he was really honored. And and I talked to my students about that too, and they just said, <laughs> you know, trying to understand, always trying to understand, like, why did he say that, and so on. And, and they just said, well, you're just the first foreigner that he ever met. And I met lots of Chinese who'd never met a foreigner, like most, the vast majority have never met a foreigner. So you really stand out, but they treat you really well. Like, you're not an alien. I, I tell you, if I went to a remote part of Canada, I would be treated uh, with uh, not as well as Chinese, who are, you know, different race of people, different civilizational background. I was just treated really well. And in fact, so well, I would say, that I started, I actually started fantasizing that I could just go out into Nanjing and I haven't said the size of the city. This is no small city. This is was 8 million. It's about 8 million now, I believe. And one of the fastest growing in the world. And so a huge city, far bigger than I'd ever lived in before. And to meet people who've never met a foreigner and coming from multicultural Toronto, where it's the most diverse city in the world, was such a huge shift. <laughs> kind of a culture shock, just that shift. And, you know, coming to a place that ha doesn't have the same mix of new immigrants, uh, like uh, as Toronto does, and so completely different. And so I stood out like a sore thumb, and people wanted to talk to me and would try their English. And uh, another story, 
uh, going to a karaoke bar. They call it KTV here. Um, I, when I went to the bathroom, there was a couple people there, and they were handing me paper towels, you know, to wipe my hands after I was washing my hands, and they were kowtowing to me. So all this stuff, like this incredible kindness and looking out for me, it, it felt like, uh, you know, it, as I say, I'd set a feudal kind of mindset, um, but kind of a gentility is how I would describe it. That's what it felt like, a, gent a genteel uh, time in history. So I just felt really treated so well, like, like a, you know, like a gold, like gold. <laughs> and so it was just incredible, like to feel this like um, kind of way of being or, or their different practices that they did, um, where it just felt like they were from another time of hundreds of years before. And not just a hundred, like a few hundred, it felt quite ancient. And, um, and then to try and make sense of that with all modern skyscrapers and the high-speed trains and the incredible subways, so safe. And uh, so just to make sense of that, that was the first question I thought is that, how come no one's ever told me this about China? I'd never heard this at all. I just thought that's weird. I'd talked to people who'd visited China. I talked to people who'd lived in China but I'd never heard anything like this. And I've traveled to 40 plus countries. I've been to Africa. I've been to a lot of unusual places. I'm an adventurous person. I can tell you stories. And I'd never come across a culture like China's. It was unbelievable. But then, and so what happened is that I got, I was so grabbed by this. This really hit me hard. Like you know, really hit my heart. I just fell in love with China almost immediately. And I just thought, what a kind and caring place. Unbelievable. And uh, and so I made it. Um, I came to China as kind of a blank slate. I didn't have any pre, um, you know, preconditioned ideas, just a little bit, uh, but not heavy duty. And so anyway, I, this was just really strange to me. And I'm just fascinated by anything that's different. And so I just took it upon myself to um, really pay attention to what was going on and to make notes about it and to actually write on Facebook. And so I was starting to post stories on Facebook and my friends would read them back home and they loved the stories because they thought, this is incredible. They said, well, you should write a book. And, uh, and so I heard this uh, many times and what I would do is just go do my thing. Often I was on my own and, you know, buying things, whatever. And if I had some unusual event that took place, I would just go to, um, uh, go, to go talk to my students about it. So uh, they would answer all my questions. So that's what really helped me. And the good part is that they're young and um, they know a lot about Chinese culture, obviously and they're not afraid to talk about sort of challenging things that maybe their parents would be afraid to talk about. So this is what's been a great source of information for me, is all my students. So in, uh, when I first went to university, it was, uh, I had master's students, so I would often go for walks with them and so on. And so I just thought, this place is so different. I want to take notes. I want to pay attention to everything. And so I decided right from the very beginning to really pay attention to the culture. It was the culture that I was really interested in and how it was so different from the West. And um, so falling in love with it immediately and wondering why no one else had seen it, I've reflected a lot on this. And I think really i think i figured it out i think it has everything to do with where i was coming from i was coming from canada and the situation i was coming from uh 17 years prior to me leaving to come to china uh my son was born i was living in uh, northern canada uh, and uh, my wife developed a very severe postpartum depression and so, and psychosis. 
And it was just an utter nightmare. The first year was unbelievably bad. And so it was overwhelming, a complete unexpected um, event. You know, you have a newborn baby boy and you should be all thrilled, but you end up trying to save his life, prevent his mother from uh, smothering him and throwing him off the balcony in the middle of the night because that's literally what she had fantasies of doing when he would cry. And so I had to, as soon as he made a noise, I would get up and grab him and go into another room and sleep with him, keep him quiet. So that was just, just unbelievable hell. And then she was also a threat to herself. I had to hide pills from her. I had to hide knives. And the good thing is she would tell me. She would tell me about the thoughts. She could do that enough, as overwhelming as the thoughts were. She could tell me, warn me. She said, you know, I'm having these thoughts about uh, our son. And can you uh, please you know, <laughs> take care of him kind of thing. So this is how we barely survived. We agreed that she would tell me how she would feel and then I would try and help her in whatever way. I was almost like a therapist. So I guess I just took on way too much. And uh, anyway, so I had to hide pills from her, knives. I remember when she went for a walk by herself just to take a break. She came back and I remember her eyes were just bugging out in terror once she returned because it was all she could do not to throw herself in front of a car. And so to hear that, that she said it was like a physical impulse that she had to fight not to do it. And so I just super admire what she's gone through. I really don't think a man could ever endure what she has because she fought it. And it was so bad though, so stressful, that there was a point near the end of the first year where I was begging the hospital, begging to, for them to give her electroconvulsive therapy, ECT, shock therapy. I was begging for it because I was sure she was going to take her life. And it was so stressful. I mean, we would rush to hospital, try and book her in, but often there weren't any beds available unless she was in the hall. And uh, so the choice was, do I leave her in a hallway or in a closet in a hospital? Uh, often with nurses who didn't know how to deal with a mentally ill person. You know, they're only on, basically on the psychiatric floor of hospitals. And this is what I was told. And uh, so, you know, my wife would not want to stay in a situation like that with people who don't, who are terrified of mental illness. So my choice was to was to leave her with in that situation or to bring her back home where I had to continue to look after her. And most of the time I brought her home because it was the conditions were that uncomfortable for her in the hospital and uh, if she didn't get on a psychiatric floor. And so that's what I dealt with for a year, you know, the first year for sure intent it slowly started lifting over the years. The second year, I would say, was you know markedly better. And we ended up moving from that northern city uh, back to our hometown of Toronto because I needed help from family. There's just no way. It was just unbelievably overwhelming. I was so stressed. And I had my own business, and I had to give that up. And so when we moved back to Toronto and, uh, and in the end, uh, we, what really happened is that it was total hell. And I was so stressed that after, this is even years later coping with it because she would get suicidal and I'd have to rush her to hospital, even in Toronto. And, uh, and she would hear voices and things like this. It was just a total nightmare. And so I ended up years later, even though that first year was the very worst, you carry this. I think it builds up inside of you. And, uh, you know, one event after another, you're basically living with someone that you start to see as like a bomb that's going to go off. You just don't know when. And so it was awful. 
to say the least. And so this is what I lived with. And the thing that got me is, I mean, I was so stressed. I, I eventually, years later, I had a stroke. And then a year after that, I had a heart attack. And so I almost died uh, trying to take care of everyone. And so it was just horrendous. And so I ended up uh, losing my job and I went on long-term disability for a couple years to recover from the stroke. And I ended up having a heart attack during that period and I had to recover from that. And I did. And so when I recovered, I had to find a job. And um, I've been a professor in Canada. And so I just, uh, there's some pretty ugly politics at work that contributed to all this too. And I just did not want to ever work as a professor in Canada again. I was so disgusted with the academic environment and uh, I just wanted, did not want to. But I tried to find a job in another area, consulting or something, but it just wasn't working out. But suddenly this opportunity opened up in China and that's how I ended up coming to China. And I think because of that really dark period dealing with that depression, um, I think I was just super sensitive. I felt very isolated. I really did not get that much help from people. I largely did this on my own. That's how I got a stroke and heart attack. And so, um, yeah, so incredible stress. And then I come to a country where everyone is looking out for everyone else, or at least for me, and helping me just with little things. None of them knew what I had gone through. No one knew. I mean, how could I tell people I wouldn't get a job if I told the, the whole story? But no one knew. It was just basic uh, decency on the street by Chinese uh, to a foreigner. And so this is what really helped me start to heal. Like it was like magical. I had just been on the edge. Uh, as I say, it was in the last few years that I had the stroke and heart attack. So that tells you how much stress I was dealing with. And so I was on the edge all the time. Just wonder when the bomb was going to go off again. And, uh, and here I come to China where everyone's looking out for me. They're uh, making sure I have the food I need. They're getting me a spoon. They're helping me on the subway, you know, walking me to a station, showing me where to change. Just completely taken care of. It was unbelievable in this alien place, alien in so many other ways. And uh, so it was overwhelming. And this is why I think I was so sensitive to this caring environment I was finding in China, because that's exactly what I didn't have in Canada. I was basically, uh, and I started getting critical of my own culture, and, and which ended up being critical of Western culture. And so that's when I got into doing lots of reading and, uh, and I stumbled across a book um, all about uh, the, um, the name of the book is called um, The Myth of Normal. That's it. The Myth of Normal by Gaber Maté and his son. It's a Canadian doctor who writes about how dysfunctional Western civilization is and how isolated we are from each other that we don't help each other out and um, and that people feel so isolated and that loneliness has now become a big issue in the West. People don't have uh, too many good friends to turn to to help them out in a difficult situation. That book was published just two years ago and reading that book that had all the answers uh, for me. Uh, when I read through that I just went I experienced that. I am, I am the uh, canary in the coal mine. I went from that kind of existence dealing with a chronic mentally ill wife and doing everything I could to take care of her to the point of getting hospitalized myself and almost dying twice. And uh, because I was not, I was doing it alone. I didn't get any great help from anyone. Uh, there wasn't, there isn't the kind of family connections that you have in China. And so to end up coming to China 
and discovering all these connections and people caring for each other and looking out was unbelievable. I didn't expect it at all. This is what made it unbelievable. I had no, I knew it was a collective culture. That's what I knew. And, and I was admittedly looking forward to going to see a collective culture because while doing my PhD, I met a guy from Turkey who told me, you know what, if this happened to you in Turkey, your life would not have changed because the whole extended family would help you. Everyone would take a little bit of responsibility and help you deal with the, your wife's depression. And he said, unlike for me, I found in Canada, if that happens to you, it's like a nuclear bomb goes off and you're at ground zero. Your life is gonna be upturned, upside down, I guarantee it. No one gets out through this easily. Uh, it is brutal. And so that's when you realize we really do need each other. And that's what we learned during the pandemic is how much we need each other. And so uh, that's what I feel like I'm here to do is tell the story about the West versus Chinese civilization, maybe the West and the East. So Western society being much more individualistic uh, where people do their own thing. Uh, they're not really thinking that much about others. They might think they are, but when you come to China, you find out what true caring is about. It is far beyond anything uh, within families than anything in Canada. I mean, the ones in Canada that would be doing it would be Chinese Canadians and probably uh, East Indian Canadians and many other uh, collective cultures that move to Canada. But otherwise, in an individualistic West, we are, we are all operating on our own. And that works great as long as everything's going well. But as soon as you get hit by something brutal, I started to see how people could end up on the street. And so, uh, yeah, so it's been a huge lesson. And so coming to China, I think I'm here to tell that story about it's a different civilization, it thinks differently, it has a long history, it's been like this for thousands of years. It's taken me to this point, here I am, uh, what did I say? Yeah, 11 years later to realize it's this guy behind me, Confucius. This is why it's like this in China. He was born in this province about 2,500 years ago during a period of war it was actually, um, he was in, he lived during the spring and autumn period, and that's just before the Warring States period. So China was a bunch of different states, and where I am right now was actually Qi State, one of the states, and uh, Confucius was from Lu State, which is right beside Qi State, and Qi State was more powerful, always trying to um, take over Lu, and eventually they did. But it was uh, the Qin state, the Q-I-N state, that ended up winning. And it was uh, the emperor, uh, Qin Shi Huangdi, was the one who unified China for the first time about 2,200 years ago. So Confucius lived before China became a country. And he was trying to, he lived in this period of war, and he was trying to find ways to, he, he became a, a, he was a government official, he worked in government, he was a minister of crime of Lu State, and he was trying to find ways to bring peace to Lu State as well as the other countries around him, and so he went back in time, he went to the library at the time, and he met Lao Tzu, Lao Tzu, and uh, who was the librarian in the National Library, and Lao Tzu educated him on an earlier period of Chinese history, 600 years earlier, 3,100 years ago, that had been really peaceful. And so he took those ideas and brought them in, introduced them into Lu's state, and you know, eventually he was not, his ideas were not followed until a few hundred years after his death uh, in the Han Dynasty. And so, it, but it's those, it's those kind of traditions and ethics that still remain today. 
And so that is the story I want to say about China. Thank you and good night.